It's the Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Welcome to Mutual Presents and our Tuesday Terror Double Feature, The Mysterious Traveler. Some days the Traveler is all about murder, and other days it's more of a mystical terror. My beloved cat Penny is snuggled up right beside me on the couch as we roll back those clocks and catch tonight's trembling double feature of Death is the Visitor and No One on the Line. The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to pay a visit to the home of Albert and Louise Jordan. As nice a couple as you'd hope to meet. In a story I call... <coughs> Death is the Visitor. <coughs> My story begins in the Jordan home late on a hot summer night. Albert Jordan is asleep and is having a nightmare about his mother-in-law. You can't pull the wool over my eyes, Albert Jordan. I'm on to your ways. Think that my only child was foolish enough to elope with you. But you made her do it, Albert. You made her. No, no. She wanted As long as I'm alive, she'll be protected from you. Albert, are you listening? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Please. Darling, wake up. What? What? What is it? You were having a nightmare, dear. You don't want to wake Mother up. She needs a good night's sleep for a trip tomorrow. Oh, oh yes, the trip. I wish it was tomorrow already. And she was gone. Are you sure you have everything, Mother? Yes, Louise. Everything I need for my trip home is in this handbag. Oh, oh now, don't forget to ship my trunk. I've already notified the expressman, Mother. He'll be here to pick it up this morning. Thank you, dear. Well, it's... Almost nine o'clock, Mother. You'll miss your train. I've never missed a train in my life. You'll even be so anxious to get rid of me, Albert. Oh, really, Mother, I didn't mean... Oh, Louise, darling, I do hate leaving you alone like this. But, Mother, I'm not alone. I have Albert. Well, I don't mind saying it right to his face. I don't trust him, Louise, and I never will. I'm rarely wrong about people, you know that. Now, see here, Mother, I've had about enough. Louise and I get along perfectly well when you're not here. See, Louise, what a temper he has. Do you want me to stay, darling? Oh, really, Mother, I'm very happy with Albert. Oh, well, very well, then I'll go, but you'd better be good to her, Albert. Yes, Mother, I will. Well, goodbye. And don't forget, Louise, Mother will be back if you need her. Yes, Mother. Bye. Louise, if your mother pays us just one more visit, I'll leave this house for good. Albert, what are you saying? In the past year, she spent eight months with us. She has her clothes here, a key to the house. Why, she's even listed in the phone book under, under our number. I tell you, I won't be responsible for what happens if she doesn't stay away. I'll write to her, Albert, and try to explain. Really, I will. Make her understand that we have our own lives to lead. You know, now that she's gone, I, I feel like a new man. I can breathe in my own house. Oh, Albert, you won't forget to put the tags on Mother's trunk, will you? The expressman will be here for it soon. No, dear. Shipping your mother's trunk to her will be one thing I certainly won't forget. Ah, uh, let me see. This is Hortense Murdoch. 
125 River Road, Ferndale, Pennsylvania. That won't be necessary, Albert. My trunk can remain here. Mother, but you went to catch your train. I know I did, but I changed my mind about going. I won't leave my little girl alone. Why are you looking so startled, Albert? Are you hiding something from me? No. No, of course not. Where's Louise? She went downtown a, an hour ago. Uh-huh. She should be home soon. I'm sure at least she'll be glad to see me. I... Oh, you haven't locked my trunk yet. That's good. So you've come back again. <laughs> you've always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. Keep me away from my only child. But I refuse to give her up. Yes, I've come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Frankly, I don't trust you. You don't trust me? No. I don't even know your background. For all I know, you may have criminal tendencies. There's a certain amount of the criminal in all of us. Most people can control their worst instincts. And some can't. Exactly. And I'm here to see to it that no one harms Louise. But, Mother, who's going to look out for you? Uh, Albert, why are you looking so queerly at me? Are you sick? Yes, Mother, I'm sick. Sick of the sight of you. Albert, stop looking at me that way. Why, you seem like a different person. I am, Mother. You've made me different. And now you must take the consequences. Albert, stay away from me. Don't you dare come near me. So you would keep coming back, Mother. Well, you came back just once too often. No, no, Albert. Don't touch me. Albert, <laughs> oh. You should have taken that train, Mother. But at least now... I know you won't be coming back ever again. I... I didn't want to kill you. But you made me. Oh, but now I've got to get rid of you or they'll catch me. The trunk. Yes, it's large enough. Even in death, you're a... Problem, Mother, but you won't be for long. There. Now I'll have to get rid of the trunk somehow. I'll think of a way. Albert, are you home? Louise, the trunk. I've got to close it. Is that you, Albert? Yes, dear, yes. Oh, I see you're locking the trunk. Yes, I was just getting it ready for the expressman. He should be here by now. Albert, is anything wrong? Uh, Anything wrong? (laughs) What do you mean, Louise? I don't know. Your face is so flushed. Oh, it's just a little warm in here, that's all. Oh, we forgot to pack Mother's robe. Look, you'll have to open the trunk again, Albert. No, I mean, uh, the trunk's full already. You wouldn't be able to get anything else into it. Why, nonsense. When Mother and I packed it, it was only half full. Oh, please open it. But it's locked and we haven't got the key. Oh, yes, that's right. Mother has them. Well, we'll just have to mail the robe to her. Oh, I'll answer the door. It must be the expressman. Make sure the tags are on it, dear. Uh, the tags. Oh, she can't go to her home. Oh, if I only had time to think, think. Wait, yes, the, that's the only thing to do. Let's go. Oh, come this way, please. You'll find the trunk in this room. <clears throat> Here it is. Are you finished, Albert? Yes, it's all ready to go. Okay. Well, let me make a record of it. Now, let me see. It's being shipped to... Uh, perhaps you'd better load it on the truck first. It's easier this way, mister. Uh, you're shipping it to uh, Mr. William Smith, 345 Wood Street, Las Vegas. Well, well that isn't the right address. Then uh, what, what is it on this uh, shipping tag, lady? Oh, uh, well, that uh, must be one of my customers. I must have been thinking of someone else when I wrote it out. Yeah, but what's the right address? Oh, uh, it's Mrs. Hortense Murdoch, 125 River Road, Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's right, isn't it, dear? Yes. Okay, I know your name and address. Uh, I'll put the right tags on later. Uh, uh, that's mighty heavy. Oh, please be careful with it. Don't worry, lady. Um, get the place it's on. Albert, did you get the mail just now? Yes, dear. Is there a letter from Mother yet? No, no, just a few bills. Oh, I'm really worried. It's a week now and no word from her. But you mustn't worry, Louise. I'm sure she's all right. Albert, you're even worried yourself about her. You look so upset. I'll answer. I'll come with you. Maybe it's a special delivery for Mother. Yes? Good morning. I got a trunk here for you folks. What? It's Mother's trunk. Yes. 
You've always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I've come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Bring it in, won't you, please? Okay, lady. There you are. But I don't understand. Why should Mother send her trunk back to us? Now, would you mind signing for it, uh, Mr. Jordan? What? Oh, yes. Here you are. Thanks. Bye. Albert, I, I can't understand why Mother shipped her trunk back to us and without even writing a word about it. Can you figure it out? Oh, well, what? Oh, no, I can't. Well, I'm going to put an end to this guessing. Louise, what are you going to do? I'm calling Mother. Hello, Operator. I want to put through a call to Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. The number is 223. Uh, why bother, Louise? I'm sure there's a letter on the way. Oh, I've waited long enough for one. I'm sure there's something wrong. Oh, hello? Oh, hello, Sarah. This is Louise calling. Is my mother there? What? Are you sure? Oh, and that's why you shipped the trunk back. No, no. Thank you, Sarah. Albert. Sarah says that Mother never arrived home. She sent a postcard saying not to expect her just yet. Was Sarah the one who shipped the trunk back? Yes. She thought that Mother had decided to stay with us longer and would need her clothes. What? Albert, where can she be? Oh, now, Louise, I'm sure she's all right. All right, she's been missing a week. How could she be? Well, perhaps she's staying with friends. Oh, you know Mother hasn't any friends. We've got to do something. Albert, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> The police investigated, but they had no clues, so they didn't learn anything. And George got rid of the embarrassing trunk just as fast as he could. Telling Louise he was going to put it into storage, he took it to a trucking company to ship it as far away as it could go. It was the only thing he could think of to do. All right, I got it straight, I guess, now. Mr. Richard Jones, 65 Ocean Avenue, Los Angeles. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. He's my brother. Yeah, and your name is... Uh... Uh, Martin Jones. Yeah? 1635 Sherwood Road, Riverdale, New York. Jones, Sherwood Road, Riverdale. All right, Mr. Jones, now let's see. That'll be $18. Oh, well, here's... Uh... There's 20. Keep the change. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Jones. Uh, here's your receipt. It'll go out right away. Uh, there's a truck leaving tonight. Don't you worry. This trunk will get to Los Angeles all right. That's fine, fine. It'll be quite a load off my mind when it's gone. A week passed, two weeks, three, and poor Albert was breathing more easily again. Until one morning when something most unexpected happened. Louise? Louise, darling? Yes, Albert. Oh, darling, I have a present for you. Some flowers. <laughs> Just saw them and thought you'd like them. Thank you, Albert. You're very thoughtful. Louise, your mother's been missing more than a month now. You can't go on like this. You'll have a breakdown. Oh, Albert, where can she be? Why can't the police find her? Well, darling, if she hasn't been found in five weeks... Oh, excuse me, dear. I'll answer it. Maybe it's news of Mother, Albert. Uh, good evening. Uh, I got a trunk here I, I think belongs to you. A trunk? Yeah, yeah that's you right. You always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I've come back, Albert. I've come back. Do you recognize it? It is yours, isn't it? Oh, no, no. Huh? No. Well, uh, ain't you the fella that shipped this trunk about a month ago? Did, didn't you give me a two-dollar tip? I'm afraid you have me confused with someone else. Don't you know where the trunk goes? Well, no. You see, it's come all the way back from California. It, it seems there wasn't uh, no such address where this was shipped to. Surely, surely it had a return address. Yeah, but the trunk got wet. Uh, uh, the return address kind of washed off, so it came back to the office where it was shipped from. Oh, but what makes you think it belongs here? Well, uh, you see, I kind of did a little detective work. The uh, initials stamped on the trunk are H.G.M. Well, I looked it up in the phone book, and the only person in town with those initials lives here. Well, I'm sorry, but it, it certainly isn't my trunk. Oh, well, I'm sorry to trouble you. I, I'd have sworn you was the guy that gave me that two-buck tip. Uh, where will you take the trunk now? Oh, it'll be put to the unclaimed baggage, uh, and then in a few months it'll be auctioned off. Auctioned off? Yeah. You'd be surprised what you sometimes find in them, just like a grab bag game. Well, sorry to trouble you. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Uh, what did you say those initials were? 
Uh, H.G.M. H.G.M. Why, uh, they're, they're, they're my mother-in-law's initials. Her name is, is Hortense G. Murdoch. Well, sure, that, that was the only name in the book with those initials. That's why I came here. Well, that was a very clever piece of detective work. Uh, yes, of course it's her trunk. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't recognize it. Well, you know, trunks, they kind of look alike. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, bring it in. Trunks are funny things, aren't they? You have something valuable in one, and just as likely as not, it'll get lost. But put something you don't want in it, uh, like a mother-in-law, and it'll come back every time. You can hardly blame Albert for being upset, especially since Louise wanted to open the trunk to look for possible clues. But Albert managed to get Louise out of the house, then uh, put the trunk onto the trunk rack of his car and started out. Several hours later, he was at the receiving platform of an all-night storage warehouse in New York. Yes, mister? Can I help you? Pardon me, but you store uh, trunks here, don't you? Yeah, sure. We store anything in here. You want to store that trunk you got there? Oh, yes, please. Okay, I'll make out a ticket. Now, what's your name? Williams. John Williams. Your address? Uh, 313 Maple Street. Yeah, but what city, mister? What oh, city? Oh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. Okay. Charge is $3 a month. How long you want to pay for? Oh, quite a while. Uh, I'll be leaving the country and... Uh... Well, what is it? Anything wrong, mister? Oh, dear. I only seem to have six dollars with me. Well, that'll pay for two months. Then we'll send you a bill. No, that won't be necessary. I'll send you a money order in a few days. I may be out of the country for several years. Okay. Leave the trunk there. I'll take care of it. And uh, here's your receipt. Just put the number of it in your letter when you send the money. I will. I, I won't forget. Good night. Good night. Hey, Mr. Williams. Mr. Ah, he's gone. There's a receipt on the platform where he dropped it. Hmm. The nervous type. Oh, well, I suppose they can forward it to him from Baltimore. When Albert found he'd lost his receipt for the trunk, he was badly upset at first. That meant he couldn't send any money for future storage charges. But after all... There was no identification inside it, and he'd rubbed Mother's initials off the outside this time. So how could anyone trace it back to him? Especially since they'd be looking for him in Baltimore. So in a few weeks, Albert was himself again. Except for a nightmare once in a while. Oh. After all, what do I know about you, Albert? You may have criminal tendencies, and I'm going to protect my daughter from you. Yes, I've come back and you're not going to get rid of me. Do you hear me, Albert? I've come back to stay. Oh, no. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I can't. Albert. No. Albert, wake up. Oh, what is it, Louise? You were moaning in your sleep, dear. You must have been having a nightmare. Oh, oh yes, I was. But it's not important... It's just that midnight snack I had. Go back to sleep, darling. But as the months passed, so did the nightmares. And finally, Albert was his old cheerful self again. Good evening, dear. How are you? I'm all right, Albert. Fine, fine. Say, I bumped into George Horton and his wife while on the way home, and they asked us to come to the charity bazaar tonight. That was very nice of them, Albert. Well, why don't we go? There'll be an auction, a raffle, supper, dancing. It'll do you good. I know, but somehow I don't feel like meeting people. But you can't go on this way, Louise, cutting yourself off from the world. I've been unfair to you, haven't I, Albert? Keeping you home night after night all these months. Oh, why, darling, you know I've been perfectly happy. It's been so nice. Just the two of us. You've been perfectly wonderful, Albert, and... I'm afraid I've been acting very selfishly. All right, I'll go to that charity affair tonight. Now, what have I bid for this beautiful antique lamp? Do I hear dollars? Do I hear dollars? I'll bid a dollar. Ah, there we have a lady with a real sense of beauty. Now, do I hear some dollars? 
You are here, Professor. Well, good evening, George. Well, hello, Albert. Hello, Louise. Hello, George. Gee, I'm sure glad you two came. Missed you both a lot these past months. Well, I hope you'll be seeing more of us. Hey, we've got quite a crowd here tonight. Oh, yeah. We hope to raise quite a bit of money. Say, that auctioneer's a genius. Come on, let's get a little closer. All right. Uh, now, uh, that gentleman over there, the one with the superb eye for beauty, bids $5 for this lamp. Do I hear five fifty? Your last chance, ladies and gentlemen, going at $5 once, going twice, sold to the gentleman in the tweed suit, and very fortunate he is. <laughs> that lamp couldn't have cost more than $3 when it was new. <laughs> well, now we come to the raffle. The raffle? Yeah, the raffle for a mystery prize donated by yours truly, George Horton. Well. Oh. <laughs> Better let me sell you a few tickets, Albert. They're I'll... only 50 cents each. No, no, thanks, George. We just came to be sociable. Better take a chance. No telling what you might win. Now, uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the feature of the evening. A raffle for a mystery prize, which I have hidden here beneath this canvas cover. Now, I'm going to lift this cover and show you a locked trunk. Now, take a good look at it. The trunk? Oh, no. It can't be. Because she's come back again. Yes, Albert, I've come back. And I'm going to stay for good this time. Oh, no, no. Now, this is no ordinary trunk, ladies and gentlemen. It was donated by a gentleman who bought it for storage charges. Now, who knows what it contains? Perhaps the crown jewels of old Russia. Or better still, uh, a case of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> now, take a good look at it and try to get. Albert, you're so pale. Is there anything wrong? Uh, no, of course not. George, where did you get this trunk? Oh, that big storage place in New York. You know, on the east side. Somebody did keep up the storage charges on it, and all the notifications they mailed came back, yes. so... Yes, I see. Now that you've seen all the prizes, and particularly seen this prize, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're going to want to buy not one, not two, but half a dozen chances each. What can be in it? Guessing is half the fun. Well, now we're all going to adjourn for supper, and immediately after supper, the big drawing will be held. So buy your chances now and win yourself a trunk full of surprise and pleasure. Well, Albert, changed your mind about buying a chance or two? Yes, George, yes, I have. I'll take all you've got. Albert, I don't understand you. You've bought every chance that was left on that trunk. Louise, I know what I'm doing. What on earth do you want with an old trunk that... Looks a lot like Mother's trunk, doesn't it? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. But of course it does, Albert. It's the same make and color. It has the same dent there. <sighs> but it couldn't be. Of course not. <laughs> the idea is absurd. Darling, you, you're acting so strangely. You didn't eat any supper oh, and now you... sakes, Louise, will you stop nagging me? <sighs> I'm sorry, Albert. Hello, hello. <laughs> Feeling pretty sure you're going to win it with all those tickets, huh, Albert? I hope so. <laughs> I knew the mystery of it would get you. Say, I've even got a ticket on it myself. So you'll have some competition. Oh, I'll win it. I've got to. Well, I did my best. I picked out the heaviest trunk the place had for sale. So I don't want the winner to blame me if he doesn't like what he finds. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready for the feature of the evening, the drawing for the locked mystery trunk. Now, my assistant has put all the ticket stubs in the wire wheel, and so I spin it, Thus, round and round it goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. <laughs> now, the stubs are thoroughly mixed, and I stop the wheel so that this lovely young lady may reach in and withdraw the number of the lucky, lucky winner. Now, will you open your eyes, please, and read the number that you have drawn? Number, number 38. Number 38. Number 38. Number 38 is the winner. Is the holder of number 38 here, please? Yes. Yes, I have it. I've won. I've won. Well, good for you, Albert. Congratulations, sir. May I have your ticket, please, so that I may compare it with the stub that the young lady drew? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here it is. Thank you. Now, I place the ticket and the stub together, and we... What is it? I'm very sorry. I'm afraid an error has occurred. An error? What do you mean? Uh, the young lady misrep uh, she misread the winning number. It is number 33, not 38. No, you're lying. I won. 
Is the trunk's mine? Uh, now, I'm sorry, but mistakes will happen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I must make a correction. The winning number is 33. Is the holder of number 33 present? Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's my number. Well, hard luck, Albert. But I guess you don't win after all. Uh, now, may I, uh, may I have your ticket, please? Yeah, sure, here, here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the lucky winner, purely by chance, is the gentleman who donated the prize... Mr. George Barton, and congratulations to you, sir. <laughs> and I hope you'll open the trunk now and let the rest of us know what we missed out on. I certainly will. No, he, he can't open it. You haven't got the key. No, no, but I have a bunch here that I borrowed from a locksmith, and one of them's bound to work. But you mustn't open it. George, George, I'll buy that trunk from you. But I don't want to sell. I, uh, I want to know what's in the trunk. That's where the fun comes in. I'll give you $100. You can't refuse. A hundred? Well, if you want it that bad, all right. I'll give you my check tomorrow. Yeah, but there's one condition. Condition? Yep. That you open the trunk here so we can all see what's in it. Oh, no, I won't do it. Well, then the deal's off. Sorry, Albert, but curiosity has the better of me. Oh, come on. <laughs> George, <laughs> George, please listen to sorry, me. Sorry, Albert, sorry. Uh, just a minute, everybody. As soon as I find one of these keys at bed, I'll... Oh, do I come back, Albert? And I have. Oh. You should have known I would. Oh, no, no. Darling, you're not well. Let's go home. No, it's no use it. It's just no use. What on earth do you mean? You will never be rid of me, Albert. Never. I've come back to stay this time. I think I've got it. Yeah, this key seems to be turning. No, wait. Wait. Uh, what is it? You mustn't open it. Oh, Albert, fun's fun, but no, after I, all... I had something to tell you. She's beaten me. I, I can't keep it hidden any longer. That's right, Albert. Tell them it's the only way you can ever be rid of me. Go on. Tell them. Well, Albert... I... I did it. I killed her. Did what? Killed who? Albert, what are you talking about? I killed Louise's mother. Her body is in that trunk. Oh, no. Albert, that's a very poor joke. Oh, it's no joke. I thought I could get rid of her, but I can't. She keeps coming back. And coming back. And coming back. And I can't stand it any longer. Go on, open the trunk now. You'll see I'm telling the truth. Go on, open it. All right, we will. Uh, please stand back, everybody. Come on, stand back, all of you. Yeah, back. Auctioneer, help me, will you? Yes, yeah, sure, Mr. Horton. I'll undo this catch now. There. All right, now lift her. Albert, this trunk. Why, there's nothing in it but old books. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Albert. He let himself be fooled by the wrong trunk. Maybe it was his guilty conscience. What happened to him? Why, he's getting the best of attention these days in a small but comfortable room with bars over the windows. The only trouble is the bars won't keep his mother-in-law out. She comes in every night to talk to him. So if you're ever tempted to... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled Murder is No Accident. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. Stay tuned to this station for another exciting crime drama. True Detective Mysteries, which immediately follows station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mysterious Traveler.
This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. <laughs> Where are we going? Why, today we're going to accompany Mr. Harvey Benson through a fateful 24 hours of his life in a story I call No One on the Line. Our visit with Harvey Benson begins on a Wednesday evening in summer. Harvey, a self-made businessman is smoking a cigar and reading the paper while his wife, Linda, reads a book. It's really quite a picture of peaceful domesticity. (coughs) Well, that's that. Nothing much in the paper tonight, dear. Too bad your poker game tonight fell through, darling. I know how you look forward to Wednesday evening. Well, it doesn't matter. Good book you're reading? Oh, yes. Yes, it's very exciting. It's a new murder mystery everybody's talking about. I would have guessed it was rather dull from the way you've been looking at the same page for ten minutes now. Oh, was I? I must have been wool gathering. Well, I guess I'll go... Oh, phone. I'll get it, Linda. No, sit still, Harvey. You're tired. I'll answer. No, I insist, my dear. (laughs) Hello. 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 That's funny. No one on the line. Well, how strange. Maybe the phone's out of order. No, I heard the click as someone hung up when I answered. Oh, but it's not worth wondering about. It's getting late. What do you say we turn in? And now we join Harvey again at breakfast the following morning. It's getting late. But Harvey lingers over his coffee as if he had the whole day ahead of him. Mmm. Good coffee, this. Pour me some more, will you, darling? Of course, Harvey. But, uh, shouldn't you be leaving for your office, dear? Oh, there's plenty of time. But it's almost 9.30. You seem very anxious to get me to the office, Linda. You're not trying to get rid of me by any chance. Oh, well, of course not. But you said you had an important appointment this morning, oh, and I yes, just thought... Oh, yes, but the fellow will wait. Mm, my good coffee, this. Harvey. Hmm? Is there anything wrong? Anything wrong? Yes. It, you seemed a little odd the last day or two, and this morning. And what's the matter with me this morning? Oh, I don't know that anything is, but you do seem a little strange. Strange? In what way, Linda, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry if I've said anything to annoy you, but... Oh, I'll answer it. Still, Linda, I'll answer it. But, Harvey, it's probably... I said I'll answer it. Maybe a call I've been expecting. All right, Harvey. Hello? 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 <laughs> Strange, there's no one on the line. Same thing that happened last night. Well, how peculiar. Oh, but that phone must be out of order. Yes, I suppose so. And yet I could swear I heard someone hang up when I answered. Oh, you must have been mistaken, darling. I suppose so. You better give the company a ring, Linda. Yes, I will, Harvey, right away. Good, and now I do have to be going. Uh, see you tonight, darling. So now we accompany Harvey Benson to his office. Uh, Because we're spending one complete day with him, remember? His office is large and luxurious, reflecting the success Harvey Benson has achieved in the world by hard work and constant vigilance. Once arrived there, Harvey plunges into his work. Until shortly before noon, the sound of the inter-office phone arouses him. Excuse me, Mr. Benson. Oh, uh, yes, Miss Johnson? Uh, Mr. Mungo is here to see you. Shall I send him in? No, ask him to wait. I'd like to see you for a moment first, Miss Johnson. Certainly, Mr. Benson. I'll be right in. Yes, Mr. Benson? Uh, Sit down, please, Miss Johnson. Yes, sir. I've brought my book. You won't need it. I just want to chat with you for a moment. I don't understand, Mr. Benson. I just want to talk to you, that's all. I don't believe you and I have ever talked before, as person to person, have we? 
No, sir, we haven't. And you've been with me uh, seven years, isn't it? Seven years next month. Seven years, and we've never talked as equals. But then, I've never needed advice before. You've noticed that I never ask advice, I suppose. Well, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. Make your own decision and act upon it, is my motto. And yet, now I'm going to ask your advice as a woman, not as a secretary. Well, I, I'll i try to be helpful if I can. Good. Now then, picture for yourself a woman who has always been very practical and, uh, well, let's say rather cold. Suddenly, this woman becomes dreamy and absent-minded. She stands for minutes at the window, looking at nothing. You speak to her. She doesn't hear you. What would you deduce from that? Why, I'd say she was in love. Excellent. Now, suppose this woman is married. Suppose on several occasions when her husband is in the room... You're following me, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir. Suppose on these occasions the phone rings... And this married woman answers. And each time she tells the party calling, he has a wrong number. What then? Why, I suppose that could happen. But now, Miss Johnson, suppose on several occasions the husband answers and the party at the other end hangs up without speaking. Why, it sounds like someone trying to call the wife without her husband knowing about it. Exactly. I felt sure I couldn't be wrong. But it's helpful to have your opinion and back me up. Well, thank you very much, Miss Johnson. Why, why not at all, Mr. Benson? And now, please send in Mr. Mungo. Yes, sir, right away. Mr. Benson will see you now. Okay, sister. Good morning, Mr. Benson. Come in, Mungo, and close the door. Sure, Mr. Benson. Uh, sit down. Yeah, sure. You have the information for me? Everything's right here in my report. Good, let's have it. I checked thoroughly on the four names you suggested. And which one was she meeting? I only witnessed one meeting, Mr. Benson. The other time, she gave me the slip. Then you don't know your business. Well, what she did was go to Duke and Baker's department store, take a dress into one of the fitting rooms, and then leave by another door. I couldn't very well follow her there. You should have managed it somehow. I... Oh, never mind that. What did you learn? I'll give you the general report first before mentioning names. All right, do so, but don't dawdle about it. Yes, Mr. Benson. As you'll see, I've called the four individuals you suggested, parties A, B, C, and D. Yes. Now, party B, Mrs. Benson knew before her marriage, but I found no evidence they have ever communicated since. Yes, go on. Parties C and D, she also knew before she became Mrs. Benson, and from time to time she's seen both of them since. Uh, but... Those meetings appear to have been accidental. Maybe so. Get on with it. But party A, the architect one, I traced him back to Atlanta. That's his hometown. Yeah? She comes from Atlanta, too. Yes, sir. They went to high school together. Were sweet on each other for a year or two. He used to keep her picture in his room. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. And since he reached New York three months ago, he's phoned her four or five times, according to the switchboard operator at his apartment house. Yes, of course. I remember how excited she was when they met at the Jennings dance two months ago. And three days ago, get this, when Mrs. Benson was downtown shopping, she dropped into Rass for lunch and she ran into him there. No doubt it was a planned meeting. It was very cleverly done. Then they sat for two hours talking and... Well, that meeting was no accident. No, of course it wasn't. Donald Arkwright. Yes, I was sure of it. Yes, sir. But if you want me to keep on following No, no, him... no. It's time for more decisive steps. I don't understand. You're not supposed to. But if you knew me better, you'd know that the moment my mind is made up, I act. I see, Mr. Benson. And I propose to act now. So send me your bill and forget the whole affair. Very good, Mr. Benson. I'll forget the whole affair. I'm very good at that. Good day, Mr. Benson. Goodbye. Hello, Donald Arkwright speaking. Oh, hello, Arkwright. This is Harvey Benson. You remember me, Linda's husband? Oh, yes, yes, of course, Mr. Benson. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm calling because I need an architect. Oh, and uh, you wanted me yes, to... Yes, I'm, I'm going to put up a summer place out on Long Island, and I wanted you to draw the plan. Well, that's great, Mr. Benson. Uh, now, what kind of site have you? I'll do better than tell you. I'll show it to you. That is, if you're free to drive out with me this morning... Well, I do have an appointment. Cancel it. This will be well worth your while, I assure you. Well, 
All right, I will, Mr. Benton. Good. Then I'll pick you up in my car. Say about uh, 45 minutes. All right, that'll be fine. I'll be looking for you. Good. I'll see you shortly, then. We'll have lunch on the way. Miss Johnson. Yes, Mr. Benson? I'm leaving for the day. Cancel any appointments I may have. Now Harvey Benson leaves his office, and we follow him to the garage where he keeps his car. Well, Joe, you have my car ready? I uh, got it right here, Mr. Benson. But look, uh, don't you want to take the new coupe? No, I said I wanted the sedan. Yeah, sure, but since that little accident Mrs. Benson had, the sedan ain't in too good a shape. It'll do for today. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is it, it ain't safe. I'm not worried. You put in plenty of gas? Yep. By gallons, Mr. Benson. But look now, don't take no chances with them brakes. They don't hold worth a cent. I'm aware of that. And that right-hand door, it sticks something terrible. What of it? What do you care? Oh, I just thought well, I'd Well, don't. <laughs> Golly, he's certainly in a hurry. With them brakes the way they are, he'll kill somebody if he ain't careful. <laughs> Seventh Street, Harvey Benson picks up his passenger, Donald Arkwright. And several hours later, they are far out in a lonely section of Long Island. Just a quarter of a mile more, Arkwright. Up ahead on top of those cliffs. That's where my locks are. I uh, surely appreciate your asking me to prepare the plans, Mr. Benson. Linda suggested you for the job. Said you were a first-rate architect. Well, that's swell of her. I wasn't even sure she'd remember me. Oh, she remembers you very well. I could see how happy she was to meet you at the Jennings party. Yeah, I was tickled that she recognized me. After all, it's six years since we last met. Well, why shouldn't she recognize you? After all, you were sweethearts, weren't you? <laughs> well, I suppose you could have called us that. We did have some good times together. Riding, hiking, and dancing. Well, it's plain she still thinks a lot of you. Now, there's the sight. Right up ahead. Oh, yeah. Smack on the edge of the cliff, huh? Well, you'll have a nice view all the way across the sound. Eighty feet sheer to the water. And not another house in miles. Look, you can see all the way down to the rocks from the bend in the road here. Well, those waves sure are kicking up a fuss. A man wouldn't last long down there. No. No, not long. But you don't have to worry. I'll build you a house that'll never slide over the edge. I'm sure you'll never give me any cause to worry. Well, here we are. Have to pull the car a bit off the road, though, to park. Oh, pretty steep here. Yes. I'll have to put in a retaining wall. Terrace the ground, I guess. There. Ah, I got her off the road. Uh, we'll leave her here. Well, we'll have room to turn around when we're ready to start back. Sure hope you have good brakes. I'd hate to slide over onto those rocks down there. I'd hate to myself. <laughs> oh, want to get out and block the wheels for me? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Door won't open. Seems to be stuck. That's right. That door does open hard. Never mind. I'll get out on this side and block them. Well, say, aren't you forgetting to set the brakes? Not necessary. But this slope is steep here. I know what I'm doing. But look, the car's moving already. It's starting to roll forward. Yes, it is, isn't it? And it'll keep on rolling. Mr. Benson? I, I can't stop your car. The brakes won't hold. Mr. Benson, it's gone over the cliff. It's gone over the cliff! Harvey stands there, watching the car roll toward the edge while his passenger struggles frantically to get out. It only has ten feet to go, five feet, and then on the very edge, the wheels twist against a rock, and the car stops. Harvey runs down the slope and reaches the spot, just as Donald Arkwright manages at last to scramble out. Mr. Benson, you did that on purpose. Yes, Arkwright, I did. You tried to kill me. Exactly, I tried to kill you. But... Why? You... You must be crazy. No, Arkwright, only myself. If you knew me better, you'd know that no one tries to take anything away from me without suffering for it. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. What's mine is mine. 
And everything that's mine, I keep. You are crazy. I can see it. Get away from me. Take your hands off of me. No, I... Get right. You uh, haven't a chance. Yes. Let me go, I say. I'll, I'll... You'll do nothing. In this world, a man has to be strong and ruthless to stay on top. And I'm... Oh, no. No, you're pushing me toward the edge. Let me go. You're going over, Let do me... you hear? You're going over. No. No. For a moment, Harvey stands, glaring down at the white-capped waters that have received his victim. Then he turns to the car. A quick twist of the steering wheel, a push, and the car is gone. Then Harvey turns away, back to the road. He walks a mile, two miles, three, until he gets a lift from a driver who takes him to the nearest state police barracks, where State Police Sergeant Thomas hears his story. Mr. Benson, you say you got out of the car to block the wheel and the car started rolling forward? Yes, Sergeant. Arkwright tried to open the door, but it stuck. The car was at the edge by the time he got it open. He he jumped, but he was too late. I see. All right, I have the details straight. Oh, it was horrible, Sergeant. He was my friend. There was nothing I could do to help. Nothing. Yes, I understand, Mr. Benson. You were quite alone at the time? No witnesses? No, we were miles from the nearest house. Why do you ask? Well, because there's a Boy Scout camp about a mile from there, Mr. Benson. I thought some of the boys might have been within sight. Oh, no, no. There wasn't anyone in sight. I see. Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Benson. It's just about dark now, so we probably won't recover the body before tomorrow. I'll notify you the minute we do so you can identify your friend. And so, late in the evening, Harvey returns home to find Linda waiting for him anxiously. Is that you, Harvey? Yes, my dear, it is. Well, I waited then as long as I could, and then I went ahead and ate. Shall I fix you something now? No, thank you. I've eaten. Let's sit down, Linda. I'd like to talk to you. Why, why, of course, Harvey. Do you have the phone fixed? The phone? Oh, no. I I called the company, but they said there was nothing wrong with it. I see. Well, they were quite right. I discovered that the trouble was from another source. I don't think I understand you, Harvey. Linda, my dear, do you consider me a fool? What? Well, of course not. Don't you suppose that I've known what was going on for some days now? Just what do you mean, Harvey? When a woman suddenly takes to mooning around the house, staring out the window, not answering when she's spoken to... The signs are unmistakable. Are you speaking about me, Harvey? And when that same woman gets several phone calls while her husband is in the room and each time tells the caller, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. There's no one here by that name. It would be a very stupid husband indeed who failed to notice. Yes, Yes, I suppose it would. But the crowning touch was those calls when there was no one on the line. One several days ago, one last night, and now one this morning. But Harvey... I I answer and there's no one on the line. But who's there when you answer? That's what I want to know, Linda. Well, what have you to say? There isn't much I can say, Harvey. Oh, then you admit it. Those calls were from someone I wasn't supposed to know about. Someone you're in love with. Yes. Someone I'm in love with. Someone I've been trying to bring myself to tell you about. Someone you've been meeting at Tawdry Rendezvous. Nothing of the kind. We've met, yes. But they've been perfectly innocent meetings, lunch, and a walk in the park. Nothing worse than that. (laughs) You're a fool to expect me to believe that. Yes, I I suppose I am. And yet it's the truth. Well, it doesn't matter. But may I inquire what your plans are? I want a divorce, Harvey. So that you can marry this unknown who telephones you and then hangs up when I answer. Yes. And I'm sorry that ever happened. It was my fault. I suggested it. You see, I was afraid of you, Harvey. Afraid? Of me. Of your loving husband. I was. But I'm not anymore. I only want to be free of you. Free to marry the man I really love. Very interesting, my dear. But slightly impractical. Do you really think I'd let anyone take you away from me? I'm afraid you have no choice. Well, you're wrong. It's you who have no choice. You're penniless, Linda. You have no family, no money, no training. You have only me. What are you trying to say? 
I'm just leading up to a story I have to tell you, Linda. A very tragic story which occurred only this afternoon. And so Harvey tells Linda the story of the afternoon's uh, events. Well, not the true story, of course. But she guesses the truth as he speaks and recoils in horror when he is finished. Oh, you've killed him. You deliberately murdered him. Nonsense. It was a tragic accident. The police have already exonerated you me. You killed him? Oh, no. No, I don't believe you. You're just trying to torture me. You know me better than that. You know that what I have, I keep at any cost. Then you did kill him. You're a murderer. Don't be hysterical, my dear. I shall be forced to discipline you. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them the truth. Linda, come back here. No, no, you can't stop Linda, me. Linda, come back. Come back, I say. Linda is gone before Harvey can get to the door. Harvey pauses, irresolute. Then he shrugs, turns back, sits down, lights a cigar. Hmm. Good cigar. I must remember to order another box. And so, Linda, you've rushed off to the police. In your heart of hearts, you hope that I'm lying. Your first move will be to rush to a telephone. You put a nickel and dial with trembling fingers. You'll hear the phone at the other end ring. And with beating heart, you'll wait. Hoping against hope that Donald Arkwright will answer. <laughs> but he won't. And then you'll know I've told the truth. Then... Hmm, will you come back first? Or will you go on to the police? I rather think you'll go to the police. For you are excited just now. And you'll return with a detective or two. I shall have to explain to them... Tell them of your hysterical spells. Then you and I will be left alone. And in a day or two, I think we'll leave on a little trip. Yes, up to my hunting lodge, where we can be alone there. And we'll get to know each other well again. Very well. And in the future... Oh, the bell. So you're back already, Linda. <laughs> I guessed wrong. Just a moment, my dear. I'm coming. Harvey crosses to the door, opens it, and recoils in surprise. Good evening, Mr. Manson. Well, if it isn't Sergeant Thomas. And I see my wife is with you. Yes, we met in the lobby. She came back up with me. I'd like to come in. Why, of course. After you, Mrs. Benson. These other men will wait out here. Thank you, Sergeant. And now do sit down, Linda. And you too, Sergeant. Oh, uh, cigar. No, thanks. We might as well waste no time, Mr. Benson. We've recovered your friend's body. Already? But surely you didn't come here to tell me that. They know you killed him, Harvey. They know. Please, Linda. You must forgive my wife, Sergeant. She's overwrought. I, I suppose she's been babbling some nonsense rather to you. She told me a story. I don't think it's nonsense. Of course it is. She's hysterical. But there were witnesses, Harvey. There were witnesses. What? That's absurd. There was no one within miles. Except a camp of boy scouts. Four of them with a scoutmaster were lying in the grass half a mile away when you drove up. They were watching for birds with field glasses. You're lying. And with natural curiosity, they turned their glasses on you. They saw your struggle on the cliff. No, no. You're lying. They went to another police barracks to report, or I'd have been here sooner. Here are copies of the affidavits they signed. Affidavit? Yeah. Look him over. Affidavit. Five of them. Yes, they seem to be in order. So, there were witnesses. I dare say their evidence is unshakable. You haven't a chance, Benson. Well, those men outside of city detectives, are you going to come quietly? Yes. Why not? What else? Is there to do? You're caught, Harvey. And I'm glad. Glad. Yes, I'm caught. But precious little good that'll do you, Linda, because he's dead. Do you hear? Donald Arkwright is dead. Donald Arkwright? Yes. You wonder how I knew it was he, don't you? 
Well, I hired a private detective. Oh. And he discovered that Arkwright had been phoning you. That oh, you'd been no. slipping away to meet him. He managed to follow you to one of those innocent luncheons. Oh, that luncheon? But that meeting was an accident. A very clever accident. But not clever enough to save Arkwright because he's dead, do you hear? And no matter what happens to me, I've beaten you. You're insane. You always have been with your lust for power. And I never guessed it till now. Fine words. But they won't change the fact that your beloved is dead and that I've taken him from you. You killed Donald Arkwright because you thought I was in love with him. <laughs> You've killed the wrong man. No, I didn't. It was Arkwright. I know it. Oh, no. Don Arkwright was just an old friend. The man I love is someone you've never met, whose name I see now you don't even know. I don't believe you. You've committed murder and you've been caught. And all for nothing. No. And that knowledge is worse to you than any punishment the law can inflict. You're lying. It was Arkwright who phoned and hung up when I answered. I tell you, it was. It couldn't have been anybody else. It... No. No. Better answer it, Mrs. Benson. No, I'll answer it. Hello? Hello? Hello! This is the mysterious traveler again. Well, that was rather a hectic 24 hours for Harvey Benson, wasn't it? He shouldn't have been quite so sure of himself. It never pays. Those phone calls now. If you get any calls and find there's no one on the line, uh, don't be quite as hasty as he was. You might get into a bad jam. I know someone else who didn't wait to make sure of his facts, and he... Oh, you're getting off here. Oh, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Ted Osborne, Mary Jane Higby, Jack Manning, and James Van Dyke. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled Death Whispers Softly. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. What could have been in the little black box that led intelligence men, Nazi agents, and Mike Waring, the Falcon on a chase of mystery and intrigue over two continents. You'll learn the answer when you hear Death Comes in Boxes, this Tuesday night's mystery on the adventures of the Falcon. Tune in Tuesday for The Falcon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. And that's this week's Mutual Presents feature. The Mutual Audio Network brings the best of old-time radio and modern audio theater to the world. Be sure to subscribe through the Mutual Audio Network podcast feed, any of our podcast days, or the Mutual YouTube channel, which includes MadCon and many other extra features and shows. See you all next time at Mutual Presents. Good night. Good night.